Yeah, we'll try to make some more. And if not, you can send me an email. I'll be glad to send you some of those. Actually, this has, uh, I, I did a presentation on this back, someone said in 2007, and I don't, I think I must have been in my teenage years then. Uh, but no, it, it, it's a very important subject because if it's sort of a little bit of theology and a little bit of church history because the church has made, gone through these things and I, I just think it's a very critical, when we talk about issues, this to me gets at sort of the heart of some of the, all the issues that we were talking about. So uh, this, what we're going to talk about here is uh, consensus theology and its impact on biblical theology as well as Greek philosophy sort of tainted church theology and therefore it still has an impact. So I want to begin with this. Just in case everybody was looking for the cursor a while ago, I found it. Cursor and precursor. Anyway, my name is Steve Lewis. I, uh, in 2020, I retired as president of Rocky Mountain Bible College and Simony, Simony, no, seminary. Uh, Dr. Niamela and I went through school together at Dallas and taught at Chafer together and taught at Rocky Mountain Bible College. And uh, there isn't anything that I haven't had him edit or read that he hasn't made vast improvements in it than what I gave him. So uh, he's one of those I have a great deal of confidence in as a friend and a colleague. So I value that, and Bob and Sharon have been dear friends for many years, and uh, I've been blessed to be a part of GES in some capacity, in some way, for a few decades. So what I want to do is look at a couple of things. What do the following slides have in common? Okay, the Big Bang Theory. Okay, you got to love that one. The universe revolves around the Earth, okay? The Earth is flat. I saw a photo the other day on a clear day. You can see the pyramids, the Eiffel Tower, and everything at one time. So I'm thinking, you know, I need my eyes checked, I'm sure, with that case. Since the Earth is flat, they now said, I told you so. And then real men don't ever ask for directions anyway. This, that's what my wife says. How about evolution? Evolution. You know, think about the unprovable things that they have in those regards. How about global warming? I, I sorry, sorry, let me rename that. It's uh, climate change. I don't know any of the centuries or millennia and epochs that the climate didn't change. But if you give me a few trillion dollars, I can work on it. <laughs> I'm just letting you know right now. And uh, my prayer cards are back, and it does have my account number on it for B World. So just in case you want to give toward that climate change, you're not going to believe this. By next December, we can make it colder. <laughs> I know. Hold the applause. In, 19, in 1900, 99% uh, of all the scientists agreed that dirt causes malaria. Two scientists, two doctors, Walter Reed, which we, the one we most famously know of, and George Githals didn't. They thought mosquitoes were the culprit. They were right. Others were wrong. What do they all have in common? These are consensus. Because we all agree on something, does that make it correct? No. Now, you know, I, I worked with boards for schools, churches, nonprofits, and all other types. And I find that one of our main goals is to find consensus. I have a good friend, Ed Underwood, and he told me as a pastor, he says, if I look for 100% consensus, there's always one person who is the, who is the power broker to hold everything up and nothing gets done. You have to live sometimes with the consequences of dealing with things directly. And biblically, we may not have all of the answers that we may desire to have, but coming to a consensus without biblical basis, it becomes a tradition, okay? So consensus. Think about the traditions at the time of Jesus' incarnation and on the earth. At the time of the Roman Empire, 
Four million Jews lived in the Roman Empire during the first century as a result of war, exile, trade, and business Jews were dispersed throughout the empire. But look at these things that were formed at that same time. A synagogue. Where do we find the biblical mandate for a synagogue? We don't. There's something wrong with it. It was a great system, okay? What about Pharisees? I mean, I looked in the Old Testament. You know, one of the things as a Bible college student or a Bible school student, you realize, wait a minute, all of a sudden you're like Old Testament, get through Malachi, and man, all those things, all those things are happening, all of a sudden it opens up and they're all talking a different language, they have all these other things, power struggles, power plays, and all these other things. And I would say all of these come about as part of consensus. That's a good way to handle it, not a bad way. The Sadducees, the same thing as Essenes, the Zealots, all of these things are critical when it comes to that which we interpret as tradition or that which is consensus. Therefore, it must have not just validity, but must be absolutely true. Not necessarily so. Okay? The opinion of 10,000 men is of no value if none of them knows anything about the subject. <laughs> that is absolutely and I am talking absolutely true. I, I, I have some colleagues that were speaking at a conference, and the first thing he says, I don't know anything about this subject, but doesn't it say this? I said, you should have stopped at the end of it. If you don't know anything about the subject, end of sentence. But that doesn't stop us. <laughs> we always go where angels fear to tread. That is a problem that we have. Okay. Confirmation bias. This is what sort of begins the process of consensus without us thinking about it. A phenomenon whereby people actively seek out and assign more weight to evidence that confirms our hypotheses and ignore all the underweight evidence that could disconform their hypotheses. I'm going to believe those people that give me the things that I want to hear rather than honesty. And that's going to, that sets us up for it, even though we're not trying to do evil, even we're not trying to do something that is bad, it ends up that way because we're not, we're not given the pursuit of that which we are entrusted with. And we're entrusted with the Word of God. We're entrusted with understanding that. We're entrusted to put our time into it. I was looking at some graduations that were happening in, in seminaries and colleges this last for the last couple of weeks. And I remember looking at all the, you know, this one school I knew of had like 50 different Master of Arts programs. Uh, and it was a seminary. One of them, <laughs> one of them was Bible studies. So that really took it. But we're all so fragmented in little things. And I talked to young adults and they're saying, what, what, what are you studying in a seminary? I'm studying how to be a leader. Well, what if you put the time into God's word, put your time into God's word, and sort of do some things on leadership? Oddly enough, a lot of this comes about when schools are <clears throat> alumni, <clears throat> pardon me, alumni are interviewed, what is the one thing they wish you'd have told you about when you were in seminary? Board leadership, Sunday school, women's whim, issues, whatever it may be. So that's what becomes the major. All of us, how many went to Bible college or seminary? A, a, a couple. <laughs> Do you ever have the time to spend in studies that you did when you were doing that? Not always. Get to know God's word because these other things will tug, pull, and all the rest. Well, I want to be this, I want to be that. If you don't know God's word, you're of very little value to the body of Christ. Even though you may be the leading expert on why folding chairs are not as good as firm, good chairs. And at this age, I like a good chair. Trust me on that one. Consensus is usually the idea of general agreement among the members of a particular or a given group or community. A standard of decision making where agreement is as fine as a lack of active opposition to the proposed course of action. 
The reason we go this direction is because nobody is opposing it. When we lived in Dallas, they started this project of somehow, this was in the early 80s, to expand Central Expressway. They sent committees people all over the world to Switzerland to look at their systems and all the rest. After about, I don't know how many billions of dollars they decided they probably needed to do something. How many years did it take to get Central Expressway? Never got much wider, but they did, she did change and spend a whole boatload of money. That's what we do in Christianity in sometimes things that we're about as well. Okay. This is a, a little bit long quote, but it's really, I like what he says. I want to pause here and talk about the notion of consensus and the rise of what has been called consensus theology. I regard consensus theology as an extremely pernicious development that ought to be stopped cold in its tracks. It doesn't say you can't have opinions. Historically, the claim of consensus has been the first refuge of scoundrels. Yeah. This is not my quote, let's put it that way. It is a way to avoid debate by claiming that the matter is already settled. Think of how many things we were told, well, that's what he said. When I enrolled in seminary, my first thought was, how, are, how am I ever going to do a master's thesis? Certainly by now, everything has been answered. <laughs> And what did we discover in class? Every week, a professor would say, this will make great this, you know, thesis topic, thesis topic. And I'm going, OK, that's four. So there's only four things that haven't been answered for 2,000 years. No, it was all of these others as well. And, and you think, so my first thought was, why haven't all these things been answered after 2,000 years? And we're going to get to the heart of that here. Whenever you hear that consensus theologians agree on something or another, reach for your wallet because you're going to be had. Let's be clear. The work of theology is not, has nothing to do with consensus. Consensus is the business of politics. <clears throat> now, I know you all are excited about all the great things happening in politics today. <clears throat> I don't care what television station, what personality, what newspaper, whatever you read, they all agree with each other. We wish. It doesn't happen. Okay? The, the greatest theologians in history are great precisely because they broke the consensus. One of the things I've enjoyed working with Dr. Nyamala is that he just, he digs in. And one day, John and I, and, and for, for, uh, Zane Hodges were having lunch, and, I, and John got up for something, and I said, Zane, I said, I, I really think that John is, is doing the same thing that you taught both of us. He's the real one that should, should be succeeding. He says, Steve, John passed me up a long time ago. Now, that's humbling come from a man like Zane. I don't think I've ever told John this, and I don't think I will, so shh. Theology is such, is no such, there's no such thing as consensus theology, but it's consensus. It isn't theology. If it's theology, it isn't consensus, period. If the Bible doesn't say it, I don't care how many people agree or disagree. Things we've been discussing this week <clears throat> that are issues, they're all part of things that, 50, 200 years ago, someone said, no, no, we all know that. We all know that. There's no need for that. We all agree with that until you ask them. Our memories are so messed up today, as Mike Lee pointed out, they don't remember that they wrote this stuff within our lifetime. And the funny thing is, is somehow they think no one will check. No one's going to check that. No one's going to check what Dr. So-and-so said, what he wrote, what he gave out, what all the rest of it. But the current issue is the only thing that matters. The Word of God is the only thing that matters, and I trust me for that. There was something that developed years ago. It's called the Vincentian Model of Consensus. In the worldwide community of believers, every care should be taken to hold fast to what has been believed everywhere, always by all. Now, that's a, 
an interesting order. Back in 2001, uh, Thomas Oden, I don't know if you knew what Thomas Oden, a famous theologian, he delivered a paper, and in that paper uh, that he read, and I was his first respondent, and, and it was held at Master's Seminary. You may never have heard that place. I was there. And so he finished, and I got up, and, and I disagreed with him. I said, he said, the further you go back, closer to the New Testament, the, more, the clearer, the more precise is the interpretation. Nice try. So at the end of it, because he read very, very slow, we, got a, we each of us got a chance to respond, but not to a, a rejoiner after he responded. But when he finally did respond to both of our criticisms, and this second one was a, was a president of Westminster, and he loved what Thomas Oden said. He says, well, Dr. Lewis is at least sharing, I think maybe we're like 60% closer to it, where before he was like 80 to 90% closer to the New Testament, if you go into church history. A very gracious man. Uh, and all the rest. Now, this is a short overview of, of what I do in church history. This idea from Pentecost to 8100, you have Christ as the only mediator, Bible as the word of God, the ordinances as memorials, and church organization. Just sort of a brief summary there. It's not all of theology, but between 100 and 325, you have Christ plus the saints and the worship of relics, Bible plus the sacred writings, and the evolution of the writings, somewhat like this. The first writings were edificatory and lectionaries. John, Dr. Niemel has done some of the best studies that exist today on lectionaries. What it meant was they, most, a lot of people were illiterate, so they had people that would read the, the scriptures to public places and public groups, and in doing so, at the same time, they were able to go through, and the Gospel of John was one of those that they read. Isn't that something? Then from there, they developed what we call apologetical, you know, defending the faith. Then they, then they wrote what's called polemic. And then finally, they developed what's called systematic and scientific theology. This occurs a little bit later than 325. This is what we find under Augustine. He finalizes it. Finally, we got it all together. Guess what happened when they put it all together? You probably don't want to guess, but anyway. They thought they'd answered all the problems, had all the theologies, and all the rest. Sacraments now bestow grace in this idea of baptism, communion. Church organization becomes a clergy-laity separation. Now, we don't have that. <laughs> Think about it. Even in our prayer life, Pastor, pray for which we should be encouraged to pray. I don't mean that. But the pastor is the one who has the answers. Why aren't every believer in the entire church being, pro being discipled in a way that they can carry on God's word? When my first pastor, I got $50 a week. <laughs> then after about four years, they raised it to get this 50% raise, $75 a week. But... First time I said, well, we're going, to be do we're going to be doing this. And this one man raises his hand and says, Pastor, that's what we pay you to do. <laughs> and it was worth more than $50. But the idea is, is that we have these things in there. I tell people one of the things, if you mo get a hell of most evangelicals, you scratch a little below and you got Roman Catholicism, venial immortal. Scratch a little bit further, you got a little bit of karma. Yeah, you get what you deserve. But that's not what the Bible teaches anywhere but we get real sedentary in our own ways. Then we began to do what we call centralization. Local officers take power, the rise of the bishop, the senate, and the priesthood, and the union of church and state. I do a whole lecture series on church and state because uh, I've taught church history for 40 of my 48 years. I'm trying to improve. Now I have to keep updating because history keeps going. When I first taught it, Postmodernism was just barely in its infancy. Now we've passed that and going from there. Okay, let me put it this way. Post-apostolic age, a little bit there. The sacred writings, okay, we get down to Augustine. 
425, okay? Now we have our theology. Now we know what we believe. Now we know we have all the things answered because we've, we've attacked, we've defended the faith in apologetics. We've attacked the, the wrong teachings in polemics. And now we have a theology. The years go by, and now we get the invention of the printing press. Over a thousand years difference. So what do we do? We finally get, a, we're able to have a copy of the text. Now we can study it. Now we can dig in. Now we use it for proof texting what we already believe. We've had it for a thousand years. It couldn't be wrong. I was always amazed when the Protestantism revolt came in uh, 1517 with Martin Luther. The, the, all of the Catholics says, how can we be wrong? We've been right for, you know, 1,400 years. It can't be right. Something new. And now the Reformers are saying, free grace can't be new. And we go on from there. So we have it there, and they're just in a matter of doing that. Here is, the, here is where it all begins. This is the price of admission that pays everything you pay to be here. You thought it'd be better than that, wouldn't you think? Some are saying, I want a refund. Okay. Reformed theology, Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, excuse me, through Thomas Aquinas, Reformed theology through John Calvin. They all share one thing in common, Augustine. I know in parts of Texas it's Augustine. It, we call it Augustine anyway. You'll just have to live with that. Okay. Now, but if you read Augustine, now back up. You read Calvin, and he, uh, there's a book by uh, Anthony Lane, and he wrote all, was giving all the sources for Calvin's quotes. And shows all the fathers that he's coming from, and a, a lot of them are from Augustine. Okay. Augustine, we said, was what? 425, thereabouts. Now, you read Augustine, early and late Augustine. Make sure you understand the difference there. They, he has his, all of his t nomenclature, all of his terminology comes from uh, Aristotelian logic and Neoplatonism. It's just logic. How many, have, how many have ever been to a debate where Dr. Geisler spoke? Weren't you always thankful you weren't on the other end of that? I'm just telling you. You, you would debate him, and you look, and he says, do I still have legs? I think you cut it. I think I'm gone. And he, I've been to him, and it's like, it's gone. I'm going, I wouldn't even open my mouth the first sentence. He debated a guy at Perkins. This is many years in the 80s. And he was the guest speaker, so he gave his part. And the professor at Perkins stands up and goes, I have nothing to say. <laughs> so, of course, we get back to class that next week or whatever, and we go, you know, we, you, you nailed him. And Norm Geiser says, you remember, that guy's still teaching what he did before, and he's still teaching it today, even though he knows it's wrong. Because hearts are not changed by argument. The Word of God is what the Holy Spirit uses to convince us, to convict us of truth, not all the great logics that you find in Aristotelian logic and Neoplatonism. So when we get to the almost all our ologies were formed by Augustine. When you write a doctrinal statement, statement, what is to be included in a doctrinal statement? Anything you want to say about anything in the Bible. I remember we with one group, this whole group always has in their doctrinal statement a doctrinal statement of war. In war, you're allowed to lie. You're allowed to cheat because anything to get over the enemy. Well, if you look at some of the great battles with the Philistines and all the rest, it isn't saying God condoned that. It said that's what they did. So anything the Bible teaches on by definition could be a doctrine because that's what doctrine means. But after you have doctrine under Augustine, and then through these, you end up, instead of doctrine, you end up with what we call dogma. Church history was my major. John Hanna was my major professor. Someone asked about Calvinism. He was the one that convinced me 
that five-point Calvinism was the only thing that was right. How could I argue about a sovereign God who could do anything he chose to do until I studied Muhammad <laughs> and teaching in the Middle East and that God, small g, says, I don't have to keep my promises. Ha, ha, ha. 72 what? Ha, <laughs> ha. You're joking. It doesn't work. He doesn't have to be honest. He doesn't have to be anything because why? Dude, he's sovereign. As one man said, it was good to be king. And that's what he meant in all of that. So let's go on a little bit further. So, let's have, so what value are the church fathers? As we go through there, uh, there are three options. The church fathers, you do it here. The church fathers all agree and they were all correct. So what's the benefit? It's okay. Great. Okay. Secondly, the church fathers are divided. Maybe, oh, maybe a benefit, but not true consensus. Now we have the fathers are all wrong. And what do you end up? No help at all. So don't look back. The further I go back, the clearer it will be is not the method of which we should have. So we have to be able to do this all the way through. Okay? I'll just give you the title, which I thought was great. A comparison of Sermon on Mount with the Nicene Creed. Okay. How many of you have done any studies on the creeds? Anybody? Thank you, brother. Almost all the terminology is not very biblical. Now, the Apostles' Creed that most people repeat today is like the fifth or sixth one. It's not the oldest of, the, of, the, uh, of what we call the Apostolic Creed. It's the Nicene Creed. And it all, all of them I've ever read all say things in terminology that's not biblical. I'm not saying it's anti-biblical. It's just not biblical. So we have this here. But you know this. I love this quote here. The one belongs to the world of Assyrian peasants. That's what they call that area of Israel. And other belongs to the world of Greek philosophers. That's the difference. Now, we may, we may have a difficulty, and many people do, on the Sermon on the Mount. But it's still the Sermon on the Mount. It isn't just something you memorize and all of a sudden you understand it. We are still debating and arguing and studying and openly dialoguing about the Sermon on the Mount. Well, it's for today. No, it's not. It's for the kingdom. No, it's not. It's for now, but later. And then you go on and on and on. That's good, honest debate. That's what we hope we do here with what we accomplish. Probably 25 years ago, we were having a GES conference and and Dr. Rodmarker says, we shouldn't, these theologians are not our enemy. The enemy's our enemy. So uh, one of the guys gets up and he gives his and he, he's flicking through and he flicks real, pa real fast past a couple of our favorite lordship people. <laughs> and I was thinking, poor Dr. Rodmarker is just going, <coughs> what did I say? Okay. We're listening to it here. Okay. Now, here's what happens over time. This is just an illustration. We have the New Testament. Now we get extrapolation. I think I can explain this. Am I just repeating it? No, I give an explanation. So it's not all just New Testament. It goes a little bit further. Okay. The next person comes along. I think I can explain not only the New Testament, but the explanation or extrapolation of the previous guy. Okay. Let's say you get all the way to the third one. You will discover quite readily that there's nothing underneath it. Where's the scripture? We used to, you know, you know children's games, telephone. You know, I'm going to give you, I'll give you a short sentence or whatever. Unless you repeat it verbatim, any time we change it, we we know what we mean by that. We know what we mean by that word, and I think it will help you understand it better. <laughs> but we keep going on, and pretty soon you can't even recognize it. That's the studies of New Testament down through the centuries. And we need men and women, boys and girls and others, to do a better job of it. This, I think, is an answer that we developed at Chafer when Dr. Niamh and I were there. It is this idea of God's word 
we start with exegesis. I mean, I could give you all the stuff of text type, you know, all those things that we do that we don't tell anybody about. People always ask, well, what translation do you recommend? I said, when you wear the one you have out, call me. The problem is not the text. You're just not reading any of them. By you changing the Bible, it's not going to help you any. Now, I do have a preference. I do, I've taught textual criticism at two seminaries, and I have a preference. But you start with biblical exegesis, and then you do, you have to do every book in exegesis. When you get them all done, you formulate what we call a biblical theology. Biblical theology of Genesis, biblical theology of Exodus, and all the way through to Revelation. Then you put them together called a systematized biblical theology. How many have ever read Lewis Baird Schaefer's famous seven volumes? You read it? Okay. It was required. <laughs> I'm just saying. If you didn't read it and you put it in as you did, we're going to call the teacher. But the idea is, is that his was truly a systematized biblical theology. John Walbert, who was his protege, said, you know, everybody has a systematic, let's do that. Anybody remember the one reason he started Dallas Seminary? You know, remember, you ever, anybody go through that, that slide presentation at Resident? He says the reason he wanted to have this is so they have the Bible and English Bible being understood. Systematize, and then we link it toward, then we're not even ready to do a systematic yet. A true systematic to be called the queen of sciences also includes God's world, which includes all known knowledge from mathematics to hard science to soft science, philosophy, high arts, and low arts. All of this together makes systematic. We're not ready to do a systematic. We need a free grace systematic. Dude, we haven't even done biblical exegesis on all of it yet. Let's get with it. Let's make an impact. Let's start assigning these things. Someone says, how long would it take? You can't count that far. But we have to start sometime. Instead of arguing with a consensus, instead of arguing with all the other things that have gone on, let's just start doing the work. That's what God, I think, desires of every last one of us. The paper I gave you there is actually the first chapter of my book on, it's called Ad Fontes, a collection of essays concerning biblical soter salvation studies. So it's a little bit, it's not what I gave you here exactly, but it's that first chapter. So you're allowed to read that. I, did, I forgot it, I didn't put my name on my first chapter because it's in a book. It's at the editor now. They're supposed to be, they, it was supposed to be published last year. I have a contract, but it didn't. So maybe this year, maybe next year. I don't know. But I don't have time to, to put a book together and get it published. Not that anybody would care, but I do. Um, thank you. Any questions? Appreciate it. Uh, it's called, the title is actually Ad Fontes. You know what, ad, it's Latin for to the sources, to the fount. Ad Fontes is what kicked off the Renaissance. And then what did we get from the Renaissance? I know, not the Renaissance Fair. Don't go there. Don't even go there. We got what we call the Reformation. And what, stopped, what really pushed the Reformation? Hebrew studies. Guess the first thing they cut at Princeton when the, when the alumni were asked in the early teens of the 20th century. Well, if I had to do it, I wouldn't want Hebrew because I hardly ever use it. Let's not us fall into the same trap. God's word is God's word. So anyway, any questions? Good. Thank you. Oh, the clock's still ticking, crud. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't know who's doing what, so I guess I'm just doing it. You know, the last time we had comments from the floor, you know, I can believe this was 2006. I was on the panel. Bob was at the podium. I was here and two other guys, and... I will just let you remember what happened. For those of you who are there, you know. Keith. Yes. Um, Sorry. On your diagram there, why is there a double arrow between systematic theology and 
Well, I think part of, the, part of the reason I had for having arrows both ways is that systematic theology also should override and, and, and have an input in, because of the God's word, how we do it. You know, I used to teach at a Christian liberal arts college. It's now Corbin University. It used to be Western Baptist College. I was one of associate dean, and I started the adult learning program and taught a bunch of stuff there. Anyway, Bible colleges are the least integrated of all colleges. Christian liberal arts is integration of all, this, all these things with the Word of God. See, when you're teaching Bible theology, you don't have to integrate it with anything, dude. <laughs> you just accept it. But when you're doing this side of it, it's both directions. Great. Great question, Keith. Okay, can I make that thing go faster? Yes. Would you consider the majority text a <laughs> consensus? A what? A consensus. Well, almost. Uh, if, you've ever, if you've ever done critical, critical stuff of the text, do you know what an app, the apparatus is at the bottom of the Greek text? Have you ever used the, the UBS text? What are the ABCDs for in the, critic, in the what I call the Alexandrian critical text? What are those for? Anybody want to say so? The, no, it's telling you how they voted. This has an A. So I gave it a C, which means, eh, you're right. <laughs> now, I wouldn't say majority is. I think majority text is more of the Syriac the uh, Byzantine texts and the, the later manuscripts that are uh, of the majority. You know, the Alexandrian text finds, you know, like P47, and it's like this big, and that tells us that we, all of them should be the same. And, it, it, you know, the, the BD text is a beautiful text. I'm not saying that. Okay, any other question? Okay. No, you, Ron, you next. Go ahead, Bob. Sorry. Oh, you mean darker? You know what? I have to admit this. I know nothing about art and graphics. I should have asked. Now, wait a minute. Is he in here? David Jansen, help me. He graduated in my class as well. And obviously, I got none of those things that he got. He's good. I'm sorry. Yeah, good. Ron? And then, Ron, go ahead. You had a question? And then back there. Thanks. Do it quickly. There's hundreds waiting. I wish not. Yeah, don't go there. I know I shouldn't have said that. I'm glad you did. Does that explain too much, Ron? Again? Yeah. Did he become a five point Calvin? I don't remember that uh, when I was there, but why did you become a five point Calvinist if you studied under him? And how did that pilgrimage <laughs> away from five point Calvinists affect you? And where do you think Calvinism is headed? Because there are more and more books opposing Calvinism now. Yeah. Yeah. Time's up. I just, no, just kidding. <laughs> we know each other, so we can do this. No, I, I really think that, I don't know who influenced him, but uh, church history is one of the places, oh, I'm sorry. Church history is one of the places where you get, if you have a New Testament professor at Dallas and he doesn't believe what the school teaches, historical theology put them in there because you can teach anything you want and you can convince everybody to be a Roman Catholic but you're doing it from church history no I'm just kidding so but no I, I don't know I assume S. Lewis Johnson because later on he was in, he taught at Believer's Chapel I met John taught over there many times and he's a dear friend he and his wife Carol are good friends for us but it, I'm just telling you just being honest I should not have done that but no, that was really it. And I'll, I think what brought me away was I, I got together with a lot of really good free grace people. And I have to say that uh, it wasn't Zane because um, I said this at his memorial. Anybody was at his memorial when I spoke? Good, I'm not going to tell you then. 
Josh, I don't have to got that one. But at the same time, so I think people are now coming to the point saying, why do we have to assume what it was ever done before is always correct? When I was talking to Bob Wilkin years ago when he was doing his PhD in New Testament, he told me, he says, most of your studies in the PhD in New Testament is studying what other New Testament scholars wrote. Hey, it's true in all the disciplines. So what is our work? Where do we begin? We don't begin with all the commentaries you've ever wanted to read. When I was a young man, I thought the more commentaries I have, <laughs> I'm going to be smart. When I was at Chafer, I gave them 2,000 of my commentaries to the library because that's not what I want to be involved in. And I think honest dialogue are going to, it's going to sound, we're just, we're just picking at each other. I don't think so. What I've been hearing here in soft legal terms to very energetic, <laughs> I'm thinking there's a, there's a real scorched spot here I think where Dix was, you know. <laughs> But, you know, the whole idea is that good dialogue is what we're about. You know, I, I deal with people in a lot of different disciplines, and I like good dialogue. I don't like name-calling. All those things are not valuable, but I do think of we're, we need to work toward it. One more, and that's it. Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, if we think about biblical theology systemized. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 And one of the things I, I when I developed a, uh, I, I do a series called uh, the message of life from Genesis to Revelation. Three things I've always said when you when we share the message of life because I think message is a better word than good news. It's the it's a good message. And, the, and there's five different uses of the word gospel in the New Testament. You know, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, no, the, and even, even people I know on the other side, they go, no, I know, I know, there are other usages, but we all know we mean the death and resurrection. Uh, well, not everybody knows that. So, but at the same time, it's, first of all, it's always about him, not about us. Secondly, it's consistent from Genesis to Revelation. It's always been about life. When Adam and Eve disobeyed, what did God say would happen to them at that moment? No more blockbuster card. You did not rewind. Dead, 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 dead. So what has mankind needed since then? Life. Oh, I just need my sins forgiven. Let's say you could be just the old definition, just as if I'd never sinned. I got back up. The best we would be is self-righteous. And boy, we really, we'd really be good at that. But it's life he sustains. If I was shot in the heart with an arrow and I'm gone and they take the arrow out, that which caused my death is gone. Propitious death of Christ. What still remains? Dead. Without the impartation of life, all the other things are useless. And then the third thing is you need to keep the message simple enough to a child to understand. Susie, do you know the vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ? And are you aware of all your sins, Susie? She's four, and she goes, well, sure. <laughs> they don't. They can understand life and death. They can understand these things. And we've got, we've got to get just not just journals, not just papers, not just these things. We've got to create children's material, teen material, Worship material. If I sit there and have to mouth the right words or the proper words to some dumb song, you know, my wife's going, dear, stop it. I don't do it out loud. <laughs> so, but no, ex excellent question. And I think we've got to be doing better. And we have the opportunity of all the men and women that I've known in these, I've, I've known, I've met almost all of you in some way, in some fashion over the years. I trust you. We need to really get going with it.
And that's a joy to be a part of. And then we have some of the horsepower to do it, but we also have to raise the next generation with that horsepower to do it. So instead of getting a degree in you know, how to counsel people who have aller allergies to milk products, we might need to do that plus scripture. And I love it. I know, if I've offended anybody, well, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Let me just pray before I'm kicked off the stage. Thank you, Lord, for a great time together and a, and a week that just has been so joyous having me again, my brothers and sisters from all over, even my young brother from the Ukraine. Thank you for his faithfulness. Protect he and his family. In, help him to enjoy the time in Florida uh, with his uh, other grandparents. Thank you for the time we have together. Give us safety. Give us clarity. Give us honesty. And help us to never lose sight of your word revealed to us in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.